it's my honor, my distinct honor to welcome you to our third quarterly symposium of the year, this time focused on encampment resolution strategies. Um, you know, thank you for being in community with us. We're grateful for the shared learning that we're going to discover together here today and for the collective approaches uh, we can practice together that foster belonging, equity, and are grounded in evidence and community wisdom. And so we here at the Homelessness Policy Research Institute would like to share our mission with you. Uh, we are a collaborative of now over 100 researchers, policymakers, service providers, and experts with lived experience of homelessness seeking to accelerate equitable and culturally informed solutions to homelessness in Los Angeles County. And we do that by advancing knowledge and fostering transformational partnerships between research, policy, and practice. And that is the, you know, that's what we're here to do together today is, is advance that knowledge together. Uh, and before we get started into our uh, program, it is our custom to acknowledge the land and the labor uh, for which we have all been benefited from here in the United States. Um, and so HPRI acknowledges the Gabrielino Tongva people as the traditional land caretakers of Tavangar, the Los Angeles Basin and South Channel Islands. And we acknowledge our presence on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Chumash, Keech and Tatavium nations. We recognize and are committed to lifting up their stories, culture, and community. We pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, past, present, and emerging. And we welcome the ancestors' wisdom into our conversation today and the wisdom of all of the ancestors represented here in our circle, our virtual circle. HPRI also acknowledges the labor of Black and African American people, ancestors, and descendants. We recognize that the United States and global economies historically and currently rest on the ingenuity, cultural treasures, and stolen labor of African Americans and Black people throughout the diaspora. And we honor their brilliance and humanity and express our heartfelt gratitude for their infinite contributions. And we welcome wisdom and joy here. And we honor all of uh, the the labor uh, of all of um, uh, our four people uh, and community members um, that, that have contributed to our being here today. Uh, we also want to offer the shared uh, principles that we practice at HPRI every time that we convene. They may look familiar, uh, these are trauma-informed, healing-engaged care principles that we invite you to practice with us. Um, and if you ever have any observations about your practice, maybe one day you'll decide to focus on collaboration. Uh, another day you'll practice safety with intentionality in your everyday. Um, and so we invite you to share with us on social media what those practices were like for you. Uh, I would love to hear from you on LinkedIn. HPRI also, we have our actually pretty new LinkedIn on HPRI, so please find us there. Um, and we also invite you to uh, take a look at our, um, our event website for today, which I will put into the chat momentarily. Um, and so, yes, this is our social media. Uh, we're also still on X, um, so you can check us out there. Um, and this is the link for our our LinkedIn. So without further ado, I just want to um, give us an overlook at the at the agenda for today. We're going to in a moment, I'm going to pass to Gary, uh, who will finish up on our welcoming remarks. Uh, and we're really delighted to have two incredible panels. Our first practice and experience panel discussion um, is really, we're just grateful to have so so much uh, experience in this circle and in that panel and in this room. Um, our research panel discussion, uh, it's all many of our collaborative members here. 
So we um, will look forward to that uh, in, as we get to it. And I'll make sure to put the link in the chat, which also for our event page, which also has people's bios. And with that, I will pass it to Gary. Thank you so much, Saba. And for those of you who I haven't met before, my name is Gary Painter, and I'm the director of the Homelessness Policy Research Institute. Um, what brings us together today, um, I should say that many of us are coming at this question or issue from, from lots of different perspectives. I think most of us who are here today have genuine compassion to help people who are living on the streets to find a, a place to live and to have the needs met that they are currently experiencing. But I also note and appreciate you know, the agreements that we have with each other. Sometimes the language that we're going to use today might seem sterile. As a researcher myself, sometimes I can be prone to using language that sounds clinical um, and doesn't recognize the humanness of the people that who are actually experiencing trauma. Um, we can recognize that when we use terms like encampment resolution, that might mean something to some people. Um, but other terms that people are wrestling with have to do with encampment cleanups. And that word sounds a little bit more aggressive for some. And in fact, others have used terms like sweeps to express, um, I think, the, I guess, hostility and or, you know, kind of state managed or, or, or controlled push of people out of places that they're currently living. Um, and and so in this, all of this, there is a tremendous amount of tension. There's a tremendous amount of care to make sure that people who are currently experiencing homelessness are able to find housing that's not just interim, but permanent. But at the same time, there's this tremendous amount of stress in urban areas um, when people see that their cities, the places where they live, the cities, the places where they raise their families are 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 not kind of the orderly kinds of spaces that they had hoped for and were accustomed to perhaps in the past. And so what we're seeing all across the West Coast, California in particular, um, is trying to figure out how to kind of meet this public safety and individual safety issue kind of head on. How do you actually come to people who might be living in a tent or maybe multiple tents, a bunch of people living together in a, in a group to actually bring compassionate outreach, connect people to housing so that people can actually um, you know, find stability and, and, and ultimately um, you know, find healing. Um, so at present, we don't know exactly what are the best strategies to help achieve all of these ends, especially in a time where housing remains scarce. And so today we're going to try to bring, you know, our, our experts, if you will, people who are working every day with people experiencing homelessness, who are trying to bring people who are living outside inside. We're going to be talking to researchers who have been studying what strategies have been more or less effective. Um, many questions will come up. And so what we invite you to do is to engage with us um, using the Q&A feature um, to kind of just share your questions. Even if it's a question you think you have an answer to, just by sharing it, I think it will help our conversation. And there will be multiple times when we can both um, ask our first panel, which is gonna focus on people who are working every day, to implement strategies to help move people inside. Um, and then we're gonna have a researcher panel where we can, again, ask questions and, and receive answers as to what we are finding to be effective strategies. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to you, to Saba, um, to uh, introduce our first panel. Wonderful, thank you so much, Gary. Um, and I, I think that piece around being sensitive to this language is actually going to be one of the first things that um, we try to unpack um, with um, consciousness and awareness that uh, it's not necessarily in, in any way um, that we're coming with this language with a trauma-informed lens initially. Usually it comes from some other um, policy uh, effort that we choose some of these terms. And so 
I just want to also acknowledge um, that piece and um, welcome to our tremendous practice and uh, experience panel. We just want to first thank you for the work that you do every day um, around um, supporting our community members who live in community outside and acknowledge that while this subject has certainly been much more in the news the last several years, we know that you have been building on a, a gener at least a generation of expertise um, focused on trauma-informed uh, housing first approach. And so we just really wanna acknowledge your work and uh, welcome you here today. Um, I have put in the chat a link to our um, event page where you will find um, bios for, for our guests today, our panelists today. And so um, to, in lieu of saving a little bit of time um, on, on formal introductions, uh, but I guess a good place to start, um, I'll go ahead and, and put forth our first question. And then when folks respond, please feel free to share your, your name and your title. And so again, this subject of um, language, um, I think we do want to establish some understanding of these terms together as a community. And so our first question is, what do we mean when we talk about resolution um, of, of, of a encampment community um, in this idea of tents, versus RVs, um, uh, this term path to housing, um, also outreach. We know that there are several different types of outreach teams. And so I'd like to invite uh, anyone in our experience um, and uh, practice circle to, to share your, your insights based on your, um, your work and your experiences around any of those terms that I mentioned? Well, I could start off a little bit by saying what it's like to live in an encampment. As I have 15 years of homeless experience and uh, and being asked to move uh, or being told to move, um, it's it's uh, traumatic. It can be frustrating. Um, it, all those other feelings that pop up when you get mad at somebody. Um, but um, eventually, um, if you're allowed to, um, and this is what we're trying to stop is you end up returning to the same encampment because you're comfortable there and you build a new one after they've torn it down and then it, it perpetuates itself. It goes on and on um, until somebody finds housing for you or leads you to it. Thank you for generously offering your experience um, living in an encampment, inviting, uh, go ahead, Damond. Uh, yeah. So so for for me, just um, the understanding that, you know, um, being someone who has called on encampments. Right. You know, and trying to help help the individual in the encampment at the same time, help the community with blight and beautification. Um, and so, you know, uh, in one term, you know, for us, it feels like we're providing some sort of assistance, you know. And then when you look at the operation, it looks as if, you know, we're taking the bare minimum that that these homeless community members have. We're taking it from them. We're throwing it into the trash can and we're saying, grab what you can, only your essentials, you know. Um, and, you know, being unhoused, you know, your essentials aren't in a folder in the top drawer somewhere, you know. <laughs> and what we as house people see as um, as uh, uh, things that we need, uh, necessities. Uh, people who are unhoused see things as, as their necessity that we as house folks don't necessarily think is, oh, well, this isn't useful for us. This isn't a necessity. But we've taken the our homeless community members and we're, we've thrown the things that they worked so hard to, to find and get to have some sort of space, uh, whether it's on the street, in a garage, in an alley, but to make themselves comfortable. And we've come through, we've taken it all because of beautification, because of um, ordinances uh, around um, encampments. So, 
And to piggyback on that, the the hoarding that goes on amongst the homeless community is is it's wealth. I mean, everybody likes to have wealth. Um, I don't care who you are. Um, and that's just the wealth that they are able to have at that point in time in their lives uh, is what they collect. Um, yeah. Oh, hi. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ann Pasilla. I'm an associate director over at PATH. And just to build on what some of my colleagues have been seeing um, when it comes to cleanups, you know, there's the ones where the kind of refer them to a spot cleaning. So those are mostly going to be voluntary um, where, where we're giving, you know, the folks experiencing homeless um, dignity to be able to, because like some of my colleagues had mentioned, what we may see as trash or unnecessary could be that person's, you know, most important belongings and who are we to kind of judge those. So there's a difference between spot cleaning, cleaning and then we have um, other cleanups, which are more comprehensive where it's the entire encampment being um, taken down or what you know could be referred to as swept. And um, where, where that kind of in lies, and Scott had mentioned, you know, now we're um, kind of displacing individuals or, you know, they're returning to those locations and building back up again. Um, and so like, it's, uh, it's like kind of really important to kind of think of uh, those two different ways of, how cleanups can go. We definitely want to be client centered when we are doing these things. And, you know, when these cleanups are happening as homeless service providers, um, we're definitely advocating that there is some type of housing attached to these um, cleanups that are happening because we want to make sure that there is that pathway to getting services to housing for, for the individuals that we're serving. My name is Kim Olson. I'm executive director of West Valley Homes. Yes. And, and more to everyone's point and what Anne's talking about is a lot of these um, cleanups are not connected to housing. So we come through in a comprehensive cleanup. We give people sometimes just 15 minutes to move everything out of a zone. If they do not get it out of the zone, they lose it. Um, there was a point in time when they would bag and tag things. Um, I have seen less and less of that, where they will take someone's belongings, put up a ticket and tell you that you can call a number in downtown LA to go and retrieve your belongings. But if you're from the San Fernando Valley, imagine trying to get transportation to go downtown. Um, you know, you can't bring your stuff back on the bus. They won't let you. So there are so many levels where people lose their agency in this process. And I think if we are doing this work right, it's it's what Ann said. It's trauma-informed. It's client-led. We folks who live in encampments, they want cleanups. They want their trash picked up. Absolutely. They just don't want their belongings, including their vital documents, taken away. Absolutely. And I and I know that, you know, the evidence has shown that that creates much more trauma and, and makes it more difficult for people to gain housing. Um, having lost their possessions, having lost their documents, uh, and certainly the the piece about, you know, having some provision, having provision of some kind of housing, you know, is, is absolutely essential. And I really just want to appreciate uh, all of the sort of details of your work that you, that you all are sharing or, or your experiences that the general public may not, you know, really know. And so with that, with that, the spirit of that, can we get even more in depth about, um, you know, what would be the ideal way to bring people into loving community or what community or what is the ideal way? I know we've started to talk about it. Clearly, the voluntary piece, um, clearly, you know, relationship building. But I, I would just love to just sit in in that light of 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 what that vision is for really doing this work um, in in a way that builds support and and a good good feeling of, among uh the people that are living outdoors and um who would ever like to respond to that first so first i think it's important to know that there's no one definition of what's going to work because each spa each service planning area has its own challenges um la downtown la is not the san fernando valley is not the san gabriel valley and so forth and so on so uh, each each area might need its own perspective on how to approach these um, encampments and how to resolve this situation. Very a theme that we hear often 
that uh, a, a lot of times we're trying to build this big thing that's going to work for everyone, whereas people are individuals with individual needs. Um, would anyone like to add to that? I would just like to emphasize that basically what we've all said, if you're going to do this work, you have to speak to the real experts, the people who are living in these encampments about what's going to work there. And while that sounds really intensive, you have to remember that these cleanup crews are going into these encampments on a weekly basis for the most part. So there is there is the ability to make contact with those residents and, and kind of try and work out a plan as to what would work there. And, and really, those are the experts. Those are the people that we need to be talking to to see what would work um, in those areas. I mean, it's so simple, really, um, when you put it that way. Um, does anyone want to share before we move on to the next question? Any last point on that piece, like any story of, of an engagement that was successful? My name is Clifton Jones. I'm a homeless person. But people ask me. Do you enjoy being homeless? And then I will have to relate to these people the same thing in the same way that I feel. Yes, I'm homeless and I enjoy being who I am right now. I don't have nothing else to lean on. Every day I think the same, my same, my pattern is the same. You know, they don't have no job to go to, but I do have money coming from the government or the state. And this is what I live on. And when I live on these things, I become satisfied because I know I have left one, one thing to another, like the money part. I got money to, you know, spend on things that I might need, you know, might not be enough. But it is good for like clothes and, you know, food and stuff. But you got some homeless struggles and you got some homeless people don't struggle. Now, the one that's struggling is the one that don't even want nothing to happen for themselves. Mm -hmm. They're not reaching out trying to live, you know, a better life and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Me, I'm on the same road. As far as what I talked and what I just said, I know where I am coming from when I talk because I, I am, you know, who I am. Am I ashamed to be who I am? No, I'm not. I am very um, consistent on being, you know, who I am until something comes, you know, greater later. You know, this is what I see life right now. And I know it's something maybe uh, more better than what I'm saying right now. It might be better, but I won't know that until it happens. So the only thing I lean on there is for is, you know, homelessness is trying to live my life the best way I know how while I'm here. That's mm -hmm. all I know. Now to live, work, uh, Housing, I, I ain't never had my own house in my life, my, in my whole life. I've come up staying with my mama, got tired of staying with my mama. Why? Because I ain't gonna, I ain't doing nothing but hurting her by just kicking it around. I, you know what I mean? I clean up and stuff, you know, but that's not good enough. She just, she just didn't want me to be the person I was. Mm -hmm. I was a dope head. You know what I'm saying? Most of all, my mother didn't like me smoking that stuff, but I, I, it's something I enjoyed when I when I started smoking it. How did I feel when I started smoking this stuff? I don't know what I was feeling, but I know I was unhappy with my life. So I did what I did. Why I did it? I keep asking myself, why I smoked that crack and stuff. Man, just like you trying to find the same situation that, hey, man, how did I get here and how did I get there? You know, I can't explain it that way. But I know when I started smoking it, I become a lacking it. Then I become to lacking it more. Then I become to lack it more and more. Mm -hmm. It was just something that I looked at before I even looked at my my brother, my mm -hmm. parents. 
man, I wouldn't, I didn't even think about my child that much. Why? I think it was the dope. That's the only thing I can say. But putting the add on to that is it's just like you got to want to do something in order to do it. Yeah. I'm homeless, but I'm not, I can stay homeless if I want to, if I chose to. Right. And can't nobody change that from me because that's just my used to my way of used to living. And I'm trying to put it in a way that, you know, if I if I am the person that I am homeless and, and got my ways of thinking that, you know, it's all good. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what else can um, help me on that except for show me something, you know, a little bit better than mm -hmm. what. I got now, you know what I'm saying? Because so far, what I'm doing now is living the life that I live, and I'm enjoying the the life I live. You know, I I don't see nothing wrong with what I'm doing, except you know, when I get high and I let all that go, I don't get even get high no more. I think God took all that stuff away from me. I There's can't no tell you enough how much it's just such a honor to get to hear your story, and I just I'm sorry. I just had to, my heart like was expanding and listening to how you shared, how you're sharing about that you're who you are and that your current living situation does not uh, mar the person that you are and the love that you have for yourself and, and, you know, how you see your life. Um, and I just, I just think that that is a really important voice for us to be close. Your voice is a very important one for us to be close to um, as we have this conversation, because many times people just, you know, decide how others might be feeling. And so I just really appreciate you. And I appreciate Damond, your neighbor, who um, I know that you two live uh, in proximity to each other. Um, and uh, I also want to invite this next question, um, which I think is sort of speaking to a little bit about this thing about, well, who, who are we to define what is a home for others? And actually, I'm going to uh, direct this question to Kim and Damond. Um, can you help our guests and participants understand the recent rise in RV dwelling and why why have so many folks moved into RVs and you know are they doing better and and what are the risks of this growth uh of um of of RV RV community RV neighbors well well for me um looking at the RV and, and with my experience and, and for those of you who don't know I'm Damon Johnson I am the founder of Crisis Community Housing Management and former president of the Empowerment Congress Central Neighborhood Council uh and so so um one of the things about RVs you know a lot of folks are moving into RVs because you know there it's it's a it's something over their head you know it, it's a housing mechanism that is that is cheap um, and and they're able to live there. It has the restroom. It has all those things that they need. Um, however, um, a lot of the RVs people have taken advantage of the unhoused by selling them inhabitable RVs, right? Um, that that really shouldn't folks really shouldn't be living in uh, because of the conditions of the RV. Um, and I guess, you know, we look at the condition of the RVs and we say, oh, well, no one should be staying there. But, you know, our unhoused residents say, hey, this is a, a home for me, you know. Um, and one of the issues is that, you know, we've had a uptick in RV fires, uh, RVs being caught on fire and homeless residents being, you know, killed in their RVs, uh, you know, burned to death. Um, we were we're seeing an uptick in RVs being parked on main streets where vehicles are clipping the back end and hitting the back end of these RVs, you know, causing injury to the uh, person inside the RV and the person who's driving their vehicle. 
Um, at one point here in, um, in Western off in South Los Angeles, we had an RV get hit uh, from the back and it jumped onto the sidewalk and hit the lady at the bus stop, you know. Um, so the RV encampment, the RVs are, are good for residency for those folks who are looking to have stability, uh, you know, looking to have a roof over their head, not necessarily stability, but the start of having somewhere to store your things without someone else being able to go into your things such as intense where a lot of things get stolen from from folks yeah. and and i think that the the rv versus versus uh tent you know most people if they can they would probably prefer the rv um but i think uh the the you know what the city has been doing around homelessness i think that the uh, the city and the county uh, at some some point where we're penalizing people for being home um, and, you know, um, and we're we're coming up with with things that um, that we expect, uh, but we're not thinking out the whole thing. Um, for instance, for those of you who don't know, the city council passed an ordinance recently um, against the sales of RVs, uh, which um, it will go after the seller of an RV um, who's selling the RV, knowing someone is going to live in the RV. Um, and so for me, that that seems like we're penalizing um, someone who's selling a RV with the hopes of assisting someone. And we're penalizing the person, the homeless resident who is looking to be housed in some sort of way, um, because now in my eyes, in my view, with my experience, we are going to increase our on the street homelessness with this new ordinance. Hmm. Yes to everything that you said. Thank you. Um, so there's a few things. When COVID started, uh, there were many, many people. So COVID, COVID led to a lot of increase in um, RV encampments, uh, partly because there were poverty jumped during COVID, right? So there were people who made this transition from inside to outside buying an RV. At the same time, there were people who had RVs. Um, and who upgraded. There were record sales of RVs at the beginning of COVID. So all of these new RVs were coming out. People were getting rid of their old RVs. So um, it's so we had a lot of people. I have encampments that were entirely tent encampments before COVID that are almost entirely RV encampments now, to give you an idea of the shift. So um, because there were so many old and used RVs available, it was pretty easy for a few hundred dollars to get an RV. Now, this had happened before, but before COVID, the city was taking people's RVs that weren't registered after six months. There were, there were all kinds of street signs that could have your vehicle impounded. There was a moratorium during COVID that the city was not allowed to take any vehicle dwelling, whether that was an RV, camper, trailer, car, van, whatever that was. So what happened is as they had sort of kept up with a flow of RVs coming to the street and taking them from people and and not often not connecting that to housing and you're right putting people from an RV onto the street um that that flow stopped. So when they have tried to sort of restart that there is this like backlog. So they can't handle the number of RVs and campers and trailers on the street. Um there is a point that I would like to make as well that I think for a lot of our folks, that RV, even if the RV is rodent infested, whatever that is, it is four walls and a door. That is that is key. And, and when we talk about encampment resolutions, when we when we talk about housing people, we also have to make the difference between we talk about interim housing, temporary housing, the differences between congregate housing, which is really sort of like a warehouse cubicle setting versus single household occupancy, motel rooms, hotel rooms, places where people can have four walls, a bathroom and a door. That that type of privacy is essential um, to encampment clearing. And if you are going to try and move people from RVs into housing, you're going to have to offer them single household occupancy. And just to piggyback on what Kim was saying too about the number of, of RVs, with the COVID money through EDD, they all um, came up so strong on, on the funds, so they were able to go out and purchase these. 
And also, um, you know, all the uh, police tow yards for the city is saying we have no space for RV. You guys can't keep towing them and bringing them here because we don't have anywhere to store all these RVs. So that became uh, another big issue of why a lot of them were, were still sitting on the streets and the city couldn't continue to tow. Um, after COVID, uh, they stopped because of the uh, the space uh, that the tow yards had. Thank you so much. Um... I think, you know, certainly as community, we've seen the rise in RVs and, you know, from everything that everyone shared, that this is a more like like everything else to do with with homelessness, unfortunately, um, that we have these complex complex um, issues that we really need to pull apart with consciousness um, uh, around really providing that space of autonomy and making sure that everything is attached. Uh, we have the services and and um, definitely the services and the housing available. And so I wanna transition us um, a little bit into um, that piece around outreach work. Um, and, you know, as, as with most homelessness outreach work, uh, there is a risk and trade-off between keeping public and nonprofit workers safe um, and losing participant trust by involving police. Um, and so I'd like for us to talk a little bit about that trade-off um, in starting with Anne. Yeah, I would see um, in my experience in some of the cleanups um, that we've uh, you know participated in, um, we usually have planning meetings and that incorporates uh, the outreach teams that have been servicing the area, um, LAPD, um, LADOT, Department of Transportation, um, whatever that may look like. And it's so that all of us can kind of get an understanding um, and, you know, rely on the knowledge and expertise of the outreach teams who we have been working on, who is interested, who maybe needs a little bit more support and then bringing those resources together. Um, you know, and when we do have these um, activities where police are involved, we definitely make it clear that if police could take the step back and, you know, just have our outreach teams um, come and uh, present themselves first because we already have rapport with that encampment. And we know that the site of um, LAPD will, you know, scare and, you know, kind of um uh, kind of bring down that that trust that we have built. So it's a really uh, it's a balance that we all have to have to kind of play. But you know, I think as long as we're able to, you know, walk through the participants, like explain maybe why police need to be there, and then that outreach workers are given the space to be able to do what they need to do, and then if needed then rely on, you know, enforcement to to come. But when anything like that happens, you know, we will take a step back. Thank you so much for sharing. And I I think that I know that trust building is so critical. Um, so, you know, and, and then, of course, there's that trust building with the, the staff as well. So would others like to comment on that question? So in in the work that we're doing, um, and in the, we also run a uh, volunteer outreach. So we serve hundreds of folks every Sunday in addition to our regular program during the week. <clears throat> we have yet to have, and I'm not saying, I'm sure like depending on the area you're in, we haven't had a situation where we have felt the need to bring law enforcement in. Um, we're also not involved in cleanups to be clear. So, you know, we're involved in housing actions, we're involved in outreach, food, supplies, things like that. <clears throat> and I do feel like it's it's such an important thing for the folks that I work with that they know that we're not bringing law enforcement into the encampments. I think I really do think it's a key trust issue. Um, if we're if we're dealing with housing, if we're dealing with poverty, these aren't crimes, right? Um, and and bringing in law enforcement, it, it it not only makes them feel like you think that they are criminals, um, and that it, it's not just that they're not going to trust um, you. It's the feeling that you don't trust them, right? There is this mutuality that gets lost, um, and I think it's very hard to repair that. 
and I, and I think it's really dangerous to the kind of work that we do. So we we don't get involved in, in anything like that um, for those reasons. Unfortunately, the legacy of criminalizing poverty and homelessness and black and brown bodies is a legacy that cannot be erased in, you know, it's just that easily. So thank you for acknowledging. Did anyone else want to comment on that question? Yeah, yeah I, um, I've been in a few encampments in my day, uh, not only living there, but I, I do street outreach and I'm also been um, in the um, ICMS business of case management. But with the outreach to these encampments, we show up, we're, we're tasked by Caltrans, so to speak, to go to an encampment, to offer them services. And then two days later, the police show up and they think we're the ones who sent them. So yeah, it does affect us uh, uh, very, very much. And, and that trust issue. Um, and we assured them that, that we didn't do anything. So that's about the best that we can do, but, uh, yeah. And on the police perspective from talking to them, they like the fact that we're there because they don't have to play social worker. Right. They can be police. Yeah. Cause there, that's a lot to just add on that expertise for sure. Yeah. Um, and, and also Damon Johnson again, also, um, you know, um, the circle program that, uh, you know, is growing around the, the city's, uh, pilot program with the circle. I think that's a great program. Um, and I think that that has to be kind of the step we're going towards, um, where there's not law enforcement showing up at these encampments, um, and that you have unarmed crisis response teams who are trained and, and, you know, for the most part, majority of them know the communities that they're outreaching in and that they're going to. Um, and so where law enforcement may look at, you know, Mr. Bob, who's on the corner every day as, as a danger, a threat, we in the community know that, that's Mr. Bob's hangout. He's no threat. He's, you know, he's just in his area, you know. Um, so I think the unarmed crisis response to homeless encampments and, and those issues are one of the best steps that's moving forward and that we should duplicate across the city in the county. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that, Damond. And as we kind of close out this this part of our conversation today, I mean, I can't tell you enough how grateful I am for everything that you shared. Um, you know, the challenges, but then also this this piece about a program, the circle program that is, you know, is sort of a, a, an opportunity to really um, look at a, a best practice, which is one of our goals in this conversation today. And so I just want to give everyone a chance to share like maybe one thing that they want our community to know in terms of um uh, their work, um, or I think Anne on our our planning call, you mentioned something about um, what what community members can do, perhaps um, to to support their neighbors, and and no pressure for everyone to respond. But I just figured that might be a good place for us to leave this conversation. Perhaps I'll invite Anne first. Yeah, thanks so much for that, Saba. Um, before I can kind of share with um, how communities can help um, what I will kind of end with. And in all of these um, encampment resolutions, again, our, the biggest thing is housing. Um, you know, we have the motels, the interim housing, which is great. Again, Kim had mentioned, it's a safe uh, space for them to be by themselves. It's a roof over their head, but you know, that's not our long-term goal. Our long-term goal is housing. And so the more that we can build permanent supportive housing, and that's what I wanna really emphasize, um, and that's, you know, housing that is attached with case management to provide wraparound services so that, you know, we're not just housing and saying, OK, cool, we're done. They're indoors. There's more work to be done in order for them to, um, you know, retain that housing, which is our ultimate goal. And then also kind of um, integrating them into the community that they've now uh, moved into. Um, and so then I'll shift. Uh, so for anyone here, um, if you are a community member, if you are experiencing homelessness yourself um, and you are seeing someone um, that is experiencing homelessness, maybe you have a rapport with them, maybe not. Um, and here in L.A. County, we have something called L.A. Hop, which is the last Los Angeles homeless outreach portal. 
Um, so here in Spa 4, which is kind of more that metro L.A., um, you're able to, well, I'll, I'll speak for PATH because PATH oversees our Spa 4. Um, you can go online and make a online request for an outreach team um, to, to go and, you know, try to help provide services or make those connections to that person that is experiencing homelessness. Um, most of the time, especially if it's in like bigger encampments, there's already a team that is servicing that area or that, that encampment. But if, you know, you see that one-off individual, um, you know, you can see that they are really in need of help. You can go ahead and make that, um, that request be as detailed as you can give cross streets descriptions. You can be as a point of contact as well. And that's how you can kind of um, make that first step in helping to connect someone to services. Because as you know, navigating the homeless services system has very, very many uh, challenges and barriers. And then so how outreach teams, our purpose is to kind of oversee those barriers and bring the services to that individual. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Anne. And I'll, I'll look for links to put in the chat uh, for LA Hop and the Circle Program. Uh, others to close out. I would just like to quickly reiterate what Anne said about permanent supportive housing. Y'all, there is permanent supportive housing coming up in all of our areas. Support those projects. Show up at those community meetings. Speak out in support. It is really the best long-term solution that we have to homelessness in Los Angeles. Also, look for affordable housing projects coming up in your neighborhood. Support those. We have a constant flow of folks going onto the streets as we are attempting to house people. Um, so we need to we need more affordable housing housing. We need to support that. We need to support permanent supportive housing. And, and uh, Damon Johnson here, uh, you know, I think that, you know, we as community members, we we can we can also take a stand by trying to know who our our homeless residents are who live adjacent to us. Um, and like you see here, Mr. Jones, OK, um, becoming a support system for that individual. So, you know, you may have cleanup issues where this individual is staying near your home and is always, you know, if you go out and you talk to this individual, you become a, a, a familiar face, they'll start cleaning up their mess. They'll start, they'll start making sure it's nice, but we have to treat them as part of the community. And when we as house residents start to treat unhoused residents as they're not part of the community, that's when our, our trust, that's when, you know, uh, you know, we don't know triggers of individuals, you know, people, folks have mental health issues uh, and all of those things. So we want to be condescending of how are we supporting our unhoused neighbors who we see every day. And just, you know, I'm not one who just drives by my unhoused neighbors. I actually see them. I know them. I wave to them. I talk to them. You know, um, I give them change for, for food. This sets up some sort of communication and trust with the, the individuals. And I think that we all can do that. Um, and just, uh, again, just being who we can be to assist in our communities whether that's whether that's going across the street to the church that gives out food to the homeless every week and supporting them by assisting that. But we need to provide the assistance as a housing community to the unhoused community that we are neighbors with and treat them no different and then share resources with them. Oftentimes I'm hearing people with resources and they're sharing it with people who are housed. Right. You know, which is OK. But they're not necessarily the one who needs to know that specific resource, you know. So just doing what we can to communicate with our, our unhoused neighbors and provide them with some sense of community that they belong, even though they're unhoused. Following what Ann was saying about permanent supportive housing, um, it is so important. I was a, a product of it. Without it, I don't know if I would have been able to maintain my housing. Um, it was, um, it was four years before I actually started engaging life again with the training class and peer specialists trainings, um, that allowed me to become what I am today. So like coming off the streets is a, like quitting a drug is like, it's a recovery. You have to go through the process of it. And until you start replacing some of your bad memories with new good ones, you know, it psychologically, it'll, it'll, it still overwhelms you. 
even though you have your own place to stay. And the other part that I wanted to mention was, um, you know, the affordable housing, permanent supportive housing projects take a long time to be built. In the meantime, we need something that addresses these issues um, in, in an interim way with, with the likeness of a hotel room. But the tiny homes projects are cost effective. They're affordable in that sense. And, um, and they give somebody their own place, even though it's just a little bit of, of, of a place, but it's a lot, it's a lot less expensive spending $7,500 on a tiny home than it is $600,000 on an apartment, which is what's happened with some of these projects that have, that um, LA city has been um, using their HHH funds for. Thank and you. Also with the, um, the permanent support of housing. I know that, you know, um, Sometimes we have permanent supportive housing, but not all the time. The supportive part is immediately there. Um, and for instance, I, you know, as the former president of a neighborhood council, we were the first neighborhood council to, to my, um, financially support uh, permanent supportive housing in the amount of $20,000, right? And these $20,000 were for additional supports, right? Um, and we paid for their, their first year of um, meals, three meals a day. We paid for yoga classes and uh, all these things and the additional funds to help support programs come in like case management and all those other uh, supports. So I think that those are the things that are important that um, that hotels and in other instances are not providing. And so that we need to support them as well. If you know funders, if you know people who can support time in these uh, permanent supportive housing to provide programs, those are things that's also needed. Or other than that, we're gonna have folks who have housing but not necessarily immediate services with those houses. Ash, thank you so much. I'm really happy that, you know, we really put that point into the piece about services. Um, we are trying to get Measure H back um, on a citizen, like as a community so that we can have those, those funds. It can't be said enough. I can't thank each of you enough for the contributions to this conversation. It's just, it's just tremendous, uh, the gift that you've given us, uh, that you've given to our community in what you shared today. And uh, I know we had a lot, a lot of questions in the chat um, or in the q and I, I were a little bit over time, so we will definitely reserve those questions for um, the end of our conversation today. But I, I just want to thank you each again and uh, and welcome in Gary to transition us to our second uh, panel. Thank you, Saba, and thank you, uh, just partners in this work uh, who are sharing from your personal experiences, from the, the outreach that you do, and you know, a, a couple of things that really like went uplifted in my own mind um, is just how we wrestle with what it means for the public sector or social sector to be a partner in this work. The social sector that plays so many different roles, whether it's, you know, enforcing the power of the state to providing resources that are so desperately needed and then really everything in between. Um, and I think that's a question that we could wrestle with much longer than we have time today. I think the other point that was brought up in our conversation around RVs is just, a, you know, the, the lack of acknowledgement of how many people have been experiencing homelessness and unstable housing in different ways for so long. I know five years ago when I looked at the data, a third of the people who are experiencing homelessness in our official HUD kind of pit count, point in time count measures, were actually living in cars and RVs. That was before the pandemic. Um, so, and what we're seeing across the country, especially on the West Coast, is this an incredible explosion of the number of people who are living in cars and RVs. Part of that was an acknowledgement, actually, and actually willingness to count people who are actually living in these spaces. But it also points to our conversation where it's not the kinds of housing situations and, and kind of unstable situations are quite different across many different places and spaces. And so we really need to think carefully about um, how each person is experiencing homelessness or unstable housing and what we can do as a partner, as you know, putting myself in that that those shoes, even though I'm a researcher by training, um, to to think about us as part of the social fabric. How can we reach out to our neighbors in a way that 
that provides what people need and ultimately provides them the pathway to the kind of stability that that those who were sharing in our previous panel are either offering or have actually gone on those journeys together. We are going to transition briefly. I'm, I'm excited to invite my colleague, Nicole Fiore, who I got a chance to start working with in the Homelessness Policy Research Institute around six or seven years ago. Um, she, as, as Saba shared the link before, um, and I'm not gonna give a full introduction, but I, she's been working on issues of housing and housing and stability and homelessness for a number of years uh, from her work in at APT Associates um, and in partnership with the Hilton Foundation and many others. So let me turn it over to you, Nicole, to, to share some of what we're learning are our effective strategies and ways to partner. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Gary and Saba. Um, first, I just want to recognize the incredibleness of our, our previous panel. Um, Clifton and Scott, thank you for your vulnerability and sharing your story um, and experience with us. Um, that is a, a gift that we will take through the rest of our day. Um, and Anne and Damon and um, Kim, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day of being kind of on those front lines and sharing your expertise with us um, in based on kind of the work you do in your community. Um, and I will say that um, I have the privilege of working with Ann and Kim on a current evaluation for the Conrad and Hilton Foundation looking at encampment resolution efforts and ways that service providers are engaging um, and offering various uh, place-based interventions to people experiencing homelessness and encampments. Um, I have the, the pleasure of introducing two early career researchers um, who are gonna talk about their research on encampment, encampment resolutions, housing interventions, um, and street outreach. Um, Marisa Coyar is my colleague from APT Associates and she'll be talking about a project that we are doing looking at three place-based interventions across Los Angeles County. And Nick Weinmeister is going to talk about um, a recent paper that he finished looking at uh, um, at a encampment resolutions on the west side. So um, for this panel, um, East Reacher, Researcher will talk about kind of their research, their work in the field um, for about 10 minutes or so, and then we'll kind of move into a Q&A style as Saba did for the last panel. So Nick, why don't you kick us off? Yeah, sure. Great to be here with everyone. Um, for those who are uh, consistently involved with HPRI, um, hi, good to see you all. I'm a project specialist at HPRI. And um, the project that I've worked on for um, research that Nicole is referring to, we actually are just getting the final edits and finishing touches put on it. So it will be published officially this week. Um, so keep an eye out for that report. Um, so what that report was um, is working with uh, one of the providers um, over on the west side, as Nicole mentioned, specifically in the Venice area um, with St. Joseph Center as a provider that we partnered with. Um, and I don't know if folks uh, remember during the, the pandemic, there was a, a very kind of well publicized effort, um, a lot of kind of um, political and media coverage. Um, around the area that's known as Oceanfront Walk. So basically the beach boardwalk over there. Um, it's about like a two mile stretch of, of beach boardwalk. Um, and basically that was a, a very, very large scale um, effort, um, a lot of public attention. And as such, it was a very um, intriguing option for us to be able to, to, to look at that specific um, type of in-camera um, outreach um, because it was effective for so many people in such a high profile area. So the way that we um, went about that, um, by being fortunate to have a partnership with St. Joseph Center, we were able to use uh, a mixed methods approach. So we were able to, on the quantitative data side, uh, we had access to the um, housing and service data, as well as the uh, demographic data of who was being served, how they were being served, what types of uh, services they were accessing, what types of housing were they connected to. So that was the, as far as kind of numbers and quantitative go, that was the data that we were looking at. And then we also created uh, an interview protocol and, and um, uh, facilitated interviews with uh, seven, seven different uh, staff members that worked specifically on the Oceanfront Walk uh, endeavor and each of them from different positions across like positions in terms of hierarchy and in terms of kind of like what their role was. Um, and yeah, I do. should we go ahead and start with kind of like our main takeaways or just kind of give a, an idea of what was the research that we were doing? 
Um, why don't we pause on main takeaways for now and we'll circle back as part of the Q&A. Um, yeah, awesome. So Marisa, why don't you go next? Thanks, Nicole. Um, and it's great to hear about Nick's project as well. And like Nicole mentioned, hearing from um, the first um, panel and all of our speakers and, and hearing the experiences of people with lived homelessness experience, um, I think is really key to set us up um, and key to remember those um, as we, as we speak about homelessness overall. Um, so as Nicole mentioned, I'm a researcher at Apt Associates and I'm working on um, an evaluation of three um, place-based encampment resolutions. Um, and these are unique approaches to um, encampment outreach and ultimately the goal to move people into housing um, and so what we are doing on this project is working with um, three service providers across Los Angeles, um, one in Long Beach, um, SPA 2, and then in CD4 and um, the LA River Basin area. And so this project is broadly looking at what service providers are doing in terms of the approach to encampment resolution um, and what kind of um, supports are being provided, access to services, connection to services, types of housing offered. Um, and then also just looking at the um, differences. So these are place-based. So each um, encampment focus area is different in the way that the encampment is structured and kind of where it's situated um, and um, a lot of that impacts kind of what people may need. Um, and so what we're doing is um, speaking regularly with service providers to understand the approach. Um, we conduct site visits to these unique um, encampment areas. And we also speak with individuals um, experiencing homelessness in these encampment areas. Um, and a little bit about each unique approach. The city of Long Beach is working in the Anaheim Corridor Encampment, um, which is one of Long Beach's oldest and largest encampment areas. And the goal is to immediately offer people um, uh, access to motel rooms so they can then um, have further access to housing and connection to services. Um, in the San Fernando Valley, we're really lucky to work with um, uh, Kim Olson from West Valley Homes, yes, and um, uh, the outreach team at Los Angeles Family Housing. Um, and they are working together on a coordinated effort in the Plummer and Jordan area in, um, uh, in the San Fernando Valley to, um, in an area that's primarily um, RV homelessness. Um, and our first panel um, had a lot of good insights on that as well. Um, and the goal is to get people into permanent housing um, and to kind of skip interim housing and to get people um, into permanent or permanent supportive housing, um, whatever is kind of the best option for individuals. Um, and then in the LA River Basin, which is a very unique um, encampment area due to its location and kind of hard to reach population, um, is there, um, trying to make sure that people in the LA River Basin area um, along this 19 mile stretch that's split into three zones that people have access to services. Um, and I think Scott um, hinted at this in the first panel that there's kind of no one right approach. I mean, these three, um, these three place-based interventions that we're looking at as part of our study with the Hilton Foundation is that um, different encampment areas may need different approaches to getting people into housing. Um, so we can kind of come back to main takeaways, like Nicole said. That's a little bit about our project. Great. Thanks so much, Marisa and Kent, um, Nick. Why don't we talk a little bit about some of the methods you guys are using? Nick, you alluded to a mixed method study. Um, you know, what are some of the things that you guys are actually doing as part of both evaluations or both studies or, or have done? Yeah, sure. So for us, um, the service and housing data that we were looking at um, was it was 
fairly complete as far as um, some kind of homeless services data would go. We had about like a total of 213 um, participants that we had records for in um, the kind of service uh, realm. And we weren't doing anything too complicated or, or fancy, like no, no kind of regression analysis or anything like that. Um, mainly just looking at um, as people were accessing either services or were being referred to housing, looking at the patterns al along those in terms of what types of folks were being connected to those services and housing based on um, things like the uh, the VI SPDAT score, which is like a, a vulnerability index that folks might be familiar with, um, looking at folks' gender identity as well as um, uh, racial and ethnic uh, demographic data. Um, so really just kind of looking at simple types of uh, cross-tab data. Uh, type uh, analysis of that um, data set. But then I think one of the key things that um, folks alluded to in the first panel as well is that when it came to looking at housing data, we weren't just looking at like one specific snapshot in time. Uh, it wasn't just at like the first time that they were referred to some form of housing. We did have, again, by virtue of having a, a, a relationship with a, a service provider, which I can't emphasize enough is, is so key. Um, we were able to look at, um, or we were able to show in our in the kind of the first time that folks were referred to housing as part of this, as well as the last time that we had them recorded as being referred to or enrolled in a type of housing, which was still not a, a complete enough or perfect enough way of kind of looking at um, how we were able to keep people in housing, which I think is a goal towards which we all need to collectively work. I think both service providers and researchers alike are recognizing that that's really one of the main areas for improvement for us to make in terms of being able to accurately assess what types of housing interventions serve people the best. Um, but we were able to have some of that analysis in our um, quantitative data. And then qualitatively, yeah, we basically just had, we hosted our interviews. They were all one-on-one -on -one with um, some open-ended questions that we used kind of to, to get at people's experiences, challenges, um, successes, uh, highlights um, or memories that stood out, things like that. And then we coded those um, interviews and pulled together some key themes. So those were the types of analysis that we did with our mixed methods approach. Great. Thanks so much, Nick. Marisa, do you want to talk a little bit about the data collection that's going on for the Hilton evaluation? Yeah. Yeah. And um, we're still within the first year of this project. So there will be more um, Will be more data collection happening but um we uh as i mentioned are doing have done interviews with people experiencing homelessness as well as the service providers um and then we'll be working on um doing an analysis of hmis data to look at um and i think it's interesting Nick, that you also mentioned patterns um looking at this path to permanency um and so um looking at what someone's interactions with service providers may look like over um, over a period of time and how that kind of um, leads them to permanent housing. Um, when we were in Los Angeles um, over the summer, we spoke with a number of people, um, uh, and this is one-on-one -on -one interviews with people experiencing homelessness, um, and trying to understand um, where people, like are people experiencing homelessness in an area that they grew up in? Um, and what services have they been previously connected to? Have they been in any other type of shelter, like conjugate shelter or um, interim housing? Did they have permanent housing for a time and then go back on the street? Um, and then also understanding kind of the differences between like, are there any differences between someone's experience living in a tent or a makeshift shelter and then people in an RV? Um, and a lot of people that we spoke with um, were experiencing homelessness in the San Fernando Valley and were from the San Fernando Valley. We're from that area, grew up there. Um, and so framing further analysis that we do with um, I think really grounding it in people's stories and what we heard is that, you know, people didn't, for, for example, one person um, had the opportunity to get permanent housing um, like an hour away and they didn't want to leave the San Fernando Valley because that's where they were from, the area they were familiar with. Um, and this is something that we've heard from service providers is that we need to 
um, make sure that the option that people are getting for housing is something that is aligned with what they with what they need. And so um, the further data analysis that we'll do with HMIS data, will look at this path to permanency um, and someone's interactions with um, service providers and any services that they may have been connected to, as well as um, more qualitative interviews. Great. Thanks so much. Yeah. As you and I were on site up in the San Fernando Valley in early August, one thing that really struck me was that there, you know, we talked to people about previous experience, like interacting with homeless service system agencies or with the system in general. And many people had been experiencing housing insecurity or homelessness on and off for several years. But this intervention that we are studying with the West Valley Homes Yes Path or, and um, LA Family Housing was the first time that someone had kind of consistent engagement with outreach workers um, over a set period of time. And that kind of repetition led them to more trusting relationships with the outreach teams from West Valley Homes Yes and LA Family Housing um, as they were working towards kind of thinking about what that next step is for either interim housing or permanent housing. Okay, so the next question I have for you guys is, um, you know, you're both early in your careers in research and within kind of the homeless service system. What has been most striking to you as you've done this research? Like what's really stood out to you either in kind of the kind of global research context or kind of in the context of doing research on encampments in Los Angeles? Marisa, why don't you go first this time? Yeah, I think, um, I think being new to homelessness research, um, I mean, I've been working on it the past year, um, a little bit over a year. And I think one of the most striking things in terms of the context of homelessness in Los Angeles is the layers um, and kind of the, the context that it's happening in. And when you're trying to, I think one, understand like what does the context of services look like in Los Angeles? What does it look like for someone to be able to um, access these things, or let's say the first step is, is becoming document ready. Um, and that's something that a lot of service providers, I think it sounds like work on on a daily basis with people um, and, and consistently is getting people document ready. And that's something we heard from in the first panel was you lose your documents and you're starting from scratch. And so I think it's the most striking thing is really um, all of these barriers and like complexities to someone making the first step um, in, in coming out of homelessness um, is probably the most striking thing. I think we think of like, what's the biggest barrier of homelessness? It'd be like the cost of housing, but I think it's also all of these things that are happening um, in someone's daily life is like, you need to, you need to get your documents. You need to, you know, meet with um, a housing navigator, get connected to these things before all of that can happen finding affordable housing or, or being matched with a unit or um, permanent supportive housing is like the next larger barrier. So I think it's the most striking thing is just the context of the complexity that this is happening in. Thanks, Marisa. Nick? Yeah, it's, it's hard to, to narrow this, this down. There's so many things that, that are really striking. I think that's one of the reasons why it's so exciting. Um, I, while I'm like newer to the kind of research space before joining HPRI, I was on the policy team at LASA. So I have some familiarity with the kind of like systems side and like thinking about it in that way. So I think that probably influences a, a lot of the things that maybe stand out to me in, in, my, in my brain. I think kind of for our specific research project with St. Joseph Center, I wanted to touch on something that, that Marisa brought up um, around in terms of like where folks are coming from. Um, and while Marisa was highlighting something that we'd seen echoed in um, Margot Cushell's uh, state study of like folks kind of being in the area that they, they either are from or have connections to, which we've seen um, be consistent across demogra demographic survey uh, data year in, year out here in LA. Um, the Venice Beach area is obviously a very unique area in, in many ways. It's like internationally known, the picturesque beach people, even if they've never been here, they they 
And they maybe they don't even know that it's Venice Beach, but they know that image when they think of Los Angeles. And for that reason, we had um, a large uh, we were talking with a large portion of folks that were not from the area that were coming from places in in the south or from places like um, Detroit or other kinds of areas across the U.S. Um, And part of it is just Los Angeles is so big. It's such so vast. And then also it's so well known and it draws people here for so many different reasons. Um, And then kind of naturally following from that, you have folks that um, need or maybe would be open to a lot of different things. Well, we know that by and large, the desire for a permanent um, housing unit that is like single residency is really strong. Um, There's still some folks that I think um, uh, Clifton and Damon touched on it earlier, that if you are from that mental position where you're at a point in your life where you're ready for something to change, we had, um, in terms of the interviews, we spoke with um, some workers where people who had been out in Venice Beach for, let's say, multiple years, they had had um, different people maybe promise them housing and not follow through on it or things like that. They were they were ready for some kind of change. So even when it took the the, the form of short term and temporary housing and like project room key at the time for, for COVID concerns, um, they jumped on it. They were ready that first engagement. Um, but then you had folks that it took seven times of going out and engaging with them before they even were really open to talking about services at all. So I think that the, the just looking at the different pathways that you can can work to get someone on a trajectory towards um, housing and supports, I, I just always love any kinds of research that sheds light on that because it's going to take it, it's going to take everything. Um, I think obviously it's important to push to have those longer time horizons for engagement, which I'm sure we'll get a chance to talk a little bit more about that. But for people that need to have more touch kind of touch points with engagement teams to see um, the proof of this housing is available to you, these services are ready for you whenever you are ready. That's really important. But there are still also going to be people that maybe through their own experiences, they are at that point where they're ready for a change. Um, And so the ability to quickly get them into a different setting that is maybe a little bit more sheltered, even if it is temporary. Um, So I like looking at those different um, pathways and how we connect people to those pathways, depending on where they are at in their lives and what they want. Um, So that combination of array of services with individual autonomy, um, I think is really always important to have research centered on that. Awesome. Thanks so much, Nick. Yeah. And you bring up two really important points that I just want to highlight is, you know, for those of you on this on um, in this webinar who are not from LA or have never visited LA, LA is incredibly vast geographically um, and diverse in its geographic sprawl. Um, and so, you know, you have more kind of more maybe in the metro area or the Hollywood area, the Venice area, you know, maybe a little bit more diversity in who is homeless, whether they are from LA or from someone somewhere else. But even people who are from somewhere else, they didn't come here to be homeless. They, they came here for an opportunity that didn't work out. Um, you know, so many of us, you know, who have come to LA, it's for a job, it's for, oh, you know, I'm going to stay on my friend's couch, or my, my cousin has an extra room. And for some reason, that didn't work out. And, and that is why you see people then kind of experiencing homelessness, um, not coming to LA specifically to be homeless. Um, so but, but, you know, there is that diversity across LA, where Marisa was saying, you know, most of the people that we spoke, spoke to up in um, the San Fernando Valley grew up in the valley, and that's where they know. That's where you know they went to high school, they went to elementary school. That's where their family and friends are. Um, I remember talking to one gentleman who was living in an RV, and he had become almost like surrogate family members with this older couple in the neighborhood. And um, he referred to them as their like mom and dad, like, oh, I want to check in with mom and dad today. And um, so, you know, I think you have a lot of diversity and kind of going back again to what Scott said, there's no, it's not a one size fits all for different approaches for working with people in encampments and the housing interventions and and services that are offered to them. I want to ask you a little bit about um, meaningful components that can be included in research to really make make research meaningful um, and, you know, useful to policymakers, to practitioners in the field, 
people experiencing homelessness. What are some things, what are some components of your research or that you want to include in research in the future um, that to you make it meaningful? I mean, I think probably the key thing, especially when conducting um, research with vulnerable populations um, is really framing if you're conducting research that has the goal of making recommendations for some for a program or for a funder or for something to kind of move forward it's making recommendations that are grounded in um, the perspectives of people that are being affected by the issue and so I think like when you know to start us off today speaking with people that have experienced homelessness in the place that we're talking about um, and their experience, I think that's kind of fundamental for research, um, especially when we're doing qualitative, but there's a lot of, I think, really interesting ways to bring that into quantitative um, research. And I think something that I'm really interested in doing is bringing in the cultural competency piece um, and bringing in culturally relevant examples. And so I think when we think of these really diverse um, locations, such as Los Angeles, it's it's diverse geographically, but it's also diverse demographically. And so are we looking at homelessness um, and making recommendations or making, um, you know, framing next steps in terms of what communities um, what communities want, but also what's, what's relevant. And I think that framing not only research and recommendations, but also like, you know, are we reaching out to people? Are we conducting outreach? Are we, are, are we finding people in ways that are culturally competent? Um, And I think that's a piece that looks different across, across research projects, depending on like what the, what the approach is. But again, I think there's a lot of um, exciting ways to incorporate that. Thanks, Marissa. That's such a good point, especially in the context of Los Angeles or other kind of major cities across the country um, that have diverse populations. I to- totally agree with what, what Marisa was on with that. And um, just to, to me, I like to, to view it as like contextualizing or deepening the kind of knowledge that you can maybe get from what uh, maybe tend to be a little bit more quantitative methods um, because it's just like, like we're talking about in terms of LA has so many different kinds of challenges because it has so, such a different, uh, different sets of geography and demographics. But then also I, I saw in the Q and a, some folks raising some, some questions that we always talk a lot about at, at HPR, which is the, just the landscape of what's going on with service provision and in, in the homeless services sector there's a real struggle with turnover, with with loss of knowledge, people changing jobs a lot. I know this firsthand having worked in the homeless services system. Uh, So to be able to uh, make sure that you are understanding in the best way possible what you think you're understanding from maybe some of the quantitative sources, I, I just can't emphasize it enough to make sure that you're speaking with all of the experts that are, you know, still with that organization or who have worked on that. And then as Marisa alluded to also, if you can speak directly with people, that is fantastic. For us, ours was um, a retroactive kind of study. So that that moment had already passed in terms of being able to go on site and, and speak with people. But um, for sure, having the perspective of people who are actually doing the outreach and doing that engagement or receiving those services is really key um, because it can illuminate some very important points about the data, like looking at um, our data set that we noticed that there was a large initial placement of people in either rapid rehousing or um, uh, interim housing. And, you know, interim makes sense because there's maybe a little bit of uh, uh, a lack of permanent resources all the time, but I was surprised by how many people were being placed into rapid rehousing. And I wouldn't have understood uh, the context of that without speaking with the staff members. And through that conversation, we understood that um, part of what St. Joseph Center did was before even engaging that encampment, going out and trying to secure a whole portfolio of different types of housing. And one of the things that they were able to do is secure a partnership with a rapid rehousing development that was just beginning to open up. So they had a large amount of slots that they could find uh, to, to match people to. So being able to know the context of that just makes it makes your the other ways in which you're collecting um, data, it makes it so much richer. Um, like Marisa spoke about as well with um, people in, in proximity to being connected to resources 
resources. We know that there were a lot of folks that maybe initially didn't want to accept some of the referrals because it would have required them to go like 30, 45 minutes to live in an area of town that they'd never lived in before. And so for that reason, you saw some kind of shifts be behind, beyond that first referral to the second referral. And most of those, um, those kind or sorry, later referral, I should say. So that later referral um, tended to be people were in housing that was a little bit closer to Venice Beach itself. So just speaking to the importance of having those mixed methods. And then like I touched on earlier, um, I just think it's so important for us as a community to try and get around how we can look at housing uh, re uh, retention over time. Uh, that is something that I, I would like to see in any and all research projects that either we're a part of or that other folks are, are working on, because that's really going to be crucial as we continue to push for more affordable housing, deeply affordable housing and permanent supportive housing, any types of housing interventions like for formerly, formerly homeless folks as well, because people are always hungry to know like what is working and how can we demonstrate that it's working. Um, so those would be the things that jump out the most to me for research methods. Great, thank you so much. I wanna now um, open it up to everyone who was on the first panel to talk about what are your research needs in terms of you know, advancing your programs, making data-driven decisions, um, helping you understand um, or assisting you in understanding kind of the outcomes of your interventions and programs. I think, you know, when we think of research, we don't want to think of it as like research for the sake of research or research that happens like in a vacuum and then doesn't go anywhere. We'd really love to hear from the, the folks from the first panel, if there's any things that you think about in terms of like, what would be helpful um, for researchers to look at in the context of encampments or unsheltered homelessness in Los Angeles? And I see Clifton and Damon have their hands up. So if anyone wanted to come off mute and, you know, put your camera back on and, and talk a little bit about your kind of what you're interested in research, we'd love to hear it. I just pulled over. I had to jump in the car and uh, drop Clifton off to Hopix, who's taking care of him right now, who is our SPASIC service provider. Um, but I, you know, some of the research that is that I've been trying to find out, you know, um, I worked in the school district for a long time. One of the research things that I always wanted to find out is what happened to the students after the fact. And this is something that is important to know um, and with around the homelessness. You know, once someone is uh, taken off the streets, what happens to them? Where do they go? Have they been successful? Did they go back and fall back into uh, the same homelessness? So I think that becomes um, a major research question. Um, and then um, what is the reasons they fell back into homelessness uh, back on the street. So I think that that has been pertinent questions um, that need to be asked um, because speaking to folks, you know, and uh, you know, specifically like with the Care Plus operations and folks are saying, well, you know, we were offered a tent. You know, we were told to stay in the tent. You know, for instance, Mr. Jones was offered that, you know, hey, why, if you stay in the tent, we can get you off the streets. Uh, you know, and it's like, well, he stays in a van and he's still on the streets. And so Mr. Jones was reluctant, like, no, I can't do that. Why would I go into a tent? And they, they, the workers, the outreach workers tried to explain to him that it, he would be housed quicker if he was on the streets. Um, and so, so I, you know, I, I think that that is other research as well. You know, are people being housed quicker under Inside Safe if they're on the streets? Um, we do know that since the mayor's Inside Safe initiative, it has slowed down um, the manpower of the Care Plus operations because those same sanitation workers are working with the inside safe. So, so those are some of the things that I would I would say. Thanks so much. I would like to reiterate what Nick said about retention, um, and I know we've talked about this, but if we are doing all of this work and we don't know if we're getting long term results, um, I think that should give us all pause. One of the things I would I would like to look at are the the housing um, that's being offered, and in, for the interim housing, um, how successful are the placements? Um, relating that to the rules that are being applied in those placements, um, as well as um, service provider retention, I think it's a really those are really key things. I'd also like to see what interventions 
um, led to people being housed, what, what type of work and what type of ongoing work um, led to people continuing on to permanency? Like really not just did they get permanency, but what kind of work led there and talking to people who have gotten to permanency about what what they feel, right? Because that's what we need to know, um, really led to the permanency. Like what what occurred before that so that we know what to replicate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, such good points, Kim. I think, um, and as, as Nick initially brought up, really understanding this retention piece because we know that kind of on the front end of the system, the outreach, the matching, the getting document ready. We know all the service providers, outreach teams um, are, are really scaled up and focused on that and continuing to scale up. Um, but I think there is this mystery of kind of, well, what happens after, like what happens six months after, a year after, 18 months after. Um, so the retention piece is really critical to, to you know, start taking a deeper dive to look into. Yeah, if I, if I could jump in, I wanted to, to like pick up on a couple of those things in terms of what, what we can do tangibly moving forward. Um, I feel like ent entities like HPRI and others, like if we can help kind of drive the understanding, whether it's um, the understanding amongst uh, like philanthropic funders or state or public entities, um, I think that what Kim is talking about here is it's important to think about if we have service provider entities that maybe are not capable of doing kind of their own research on like, let's say let's say like encampment resolutions or pilot programs if they can work with research teams like at the very beginning where we can make sure that data is being collected in a way that we can answer those questions that would be so impactful and so helpful a lot of the time we maybe are interested in asking some of those questions and even looking at what data is there but we know that there's a huge problem with not having that kind of like exit data so if people are exiting a program what are the reasons why they're exiting maybe we're not setting up those initial conversations to, to really make sure we're consistently capturing things like what um, Damon was alluding to in terms of like, is this your first time experiencing homelessness? If not, like what things have you kind of worked through already? And like, what's bringing you here this specific time? Like having those protocols really up, set, set up up front is what's going to enable us to actually answer some of those questions and provide insight. And right now it's just not it's the data is usually not that way. And it makes sense why, like we're trying, we're in a crisis mode as a system. We're trying to house people the best we can. We're probably not always stopping and thinking like, Hmm, what would researchers really want to know at this, this step in the project? But, um, as we're saying, it's it's we're all interconnected. Like our ability to answer these questions and provide insight to the general community and to to funders and public entities, it's going to help those service providing entities. So if we can create this kind of ecosystem where uh, service providers are better able to partner with the research community, like the whole way through projects, the better able better able we will be to show what is effective in those. Um, and I. I don't want to like dominate, but I do want to make sure I have like just a, like a few takeaways at some point, just just from our research, just because I, I do feel like there's some best practice stuff that we can share. Yeah, well, why don't we turn to that right now, uh, Nick and Marisa? Are there any big takeaways um, that you'd want to highlight uh, regard like regarding your projects or thinking about future projects um, in kind of understanding encampments um, and the people who live in them? Um, housing interventions, um, supportive services, outreach, et cetera. Um, so why don't you guys talk a little bit about big takeaways from the research and then we'll turn it back to Saba. Yeah, and I can go, um, since we're still um, earlier into our project, I think Nick has, has um, more formulated big takeaways, but I think um, based on what we've seen kind of in this first year is, um, I think these really intentional coordinated efforts of repeated interaction with people. Um, and I think a big theme also that the first panel talked about earlier was building trust. Um, and that's when we've kind of seen these different interventions um, is the time that you spend on the front end, really building up trust with people um, and and kind of like laying out like, okay, this, this is my role here is to build trust with you, is to get you into housing. Like, how can I help you meet your needs? Like, where are you, where are you at? Um, and I think that's, 
you know, we're still early in this, in this evaluation, but I think seeing these, um, seeing early results of repeated um, interaction and really targeted focused outreach in an encampment area, I think is, is one thing that could be a really effective strategy um, in terms of, of building trust in a community and getting people on a path to permanency. And that's going to look different for every person, but um, just trying to build up that trust at the front end. And um, I think I'm going to speak highly of Kim's work at West Valley Homes. Yes, I think she um, do does a really phenomenal job of building trust with people and following them um, and um, understanding and putting a really big emphasis on every person is different and every person's path to permanency might look different. Um, and so I think that's one really big takeaway in terms of the research. Um, I think as researchers, we like to say like, this is going to be an approach, this is going to be what works, but that might look different for people. And that might look different as we're looking at these three place-based interventions. Um, what works in the San Fernando Valley might not work in a more densely populated urban area. The, um, you know, the demographics of a location might change what works. Um, and that doesn't mean that I think one intervention is, you know, more effective. I think we also have to look at like, is this the community that it's going to be effective in? And so I think as researchers, a takeaway is to say like, really taking this, this piece of a path to permanency might look different for each person and saying the approaches might need to look different based on, on where we're trying to apply them. Yeah, um, definitely want to say from our perspective as we're closing out this um, report that for sure what Marisa raised in terms of like repeated contact, repeated engagement is is one of, I think, the most important findings from, from our work, um, which is that, you know, it depends on where we're at, who's facilitating the kind of cleanup or what the effort is, but we oftentimes don't see a, a, a very long kind of time horizon of people engaging repeatedly with folks. With OFW, that was the case. They were out there for, for weeks, over, over a month, in terms of engaging consistently with people. Um, and, and that just opens up so many more possibilities in terms of getting people to yes of, of some kind of service or housing. And um, specifically with like, just given the size and the scale of that, that OFW encampment, um, one of the things that I thought was really fantastic that we were able to figure uh, or, or learn about, I should say, through our um, interviews was um, almost like a, a cohort collaborator effect that we saw with um, people who were getting access to those services and the, that, that housing, they, without being prompted, without being requested, they were going back out to the beach boardwalk and talking to some of their friends like, hey, these offers are for real. I'm in this uh, studio apartment. I have TV. I have a refrigerator. I have a shower. And it's been two weeks and I'm already here. You, The same can be true for you. So you had people who had the social capital that is just unattainable for anyone who's not from that encampment who were willingly helping out the, the effort by helping their friends get um, in contact with services and housing. So having that ability to create multiple points of contact not only builds trust, but it gives folks the opportunity who connect with those services early to show that that those services are for real, that those offers are not just, you know, getting put on a waiting list for several years. So that was a huge one. Another big takeaway I would say is the, the diversity of, of housing interventions that um, St. That St. Joseph Center had was, I alluded to this a little bit earlier, but it's so important for a number of reasons because People, as we've talked about the kind of plurality of reasons why folks end up um, on the street, it may look really, really different. Um, people may have a really strong preference for having uh, a single occupancy kind of, of room right away. That's they know what they what they want and it might be that. Um, we also, and while I'm more familiar with that, I, it was it, in this way, it's always, I think, helpful as a researcher to, to be open, having your mind ch changed a little bit or open to different perspectives. One of the things we heard about is for some folks who maybe were in recovery, they were interested in a shared housing situation, having that kind of uh, peer, um, peer to peer contact, peer mentorship. 
but it did become a challenge when folks were maybe um, paired in shared housing with folks who were not on, on a, a journey towards recovery. Perhaps they were um, engaging in, in substance use. Um, so that became a different kind of challenge. So the ability to have a wide array of housing, but then have those intentional conversations that lead to you hopefully um, pairing people with uh, the right kind of housing or with the right kind of shared housing um, uh, occupants, like partner occupants, I think is is really important. Um, and some of that can also be attached to like keeping uh, groups of people who kind of have more familial units. That's something we also heard about in terms of the encampment was so large that St. Joseph Center staff was able to use um, like drone footage to, to create kind of a map and divide that uh, encampment up into smaller regions. And what they found is that you would have kinds of smaller pockets of, of people that would maybe come together over like shared identity, shared activities, things that they liked to do together, um, especially among some of the younger encampment residents. They formed basically familial kinds of bonds. So the ability to, to keep those groups of people together um, in their housing is really crucial in terms of keeping them housed over the longer period of time. Um, and then as far as kind of things that we can look forward to for, for improving um, encampment outreach, I always think that having the strongest mental health service pro partnerships, as well as like the largest amount of, of kind of available options for people to contact those services is really crucial. Um, I think that based on what we've looked at for St. Joseph Center's service data kind of overall, this encampment was, it wasn't statistically significantly different than other kinds of, of populations that they interact with. And I say that because there is almost always a high prevalence of, of histories of trauma that either led folks into homelessness or becoming homeless in and of itself is an experience of trauma and being unhoused and unsheltered, it, it often leaves you vulnerable to more experiences of trauma. And so you need multiple interactions with people that you trust to try and address some of those issues that may wind up um, making it even harder for you yourself to accept housing. So having those ample mental health provision uh, slots available for people who are going to be patient, um, careful and build that rapport, build that trust and try and connect folks um, in a way that they feel safe and supported, um, I think is also a really crucial takeaway. And then as we, the, I'll just wrap up with the, um, again, thinking about our service provision sector itself, the Oceanfront Walk effort was very, very high profile, very politicized by then Sheriff Villanueva. Um, so there was a large media presence virtually all the time. So you had folks who were out in the sun in the summer, walking miles up and down this beach stretch to try to engage with people. And anytime that they were taking a break for water or something, people were in their face with cameras, you know, why aren't you helping the homeless people? That's what you're supposed to be doing. What's going on? And so the ability to uh, support our uh, our service workers that are doing that work, you know, something like having an area that people can go to for a break time or for a time for a team to get together after a particularly hard interaction and debrief on that and process what's going on, I think is also uh, really crucial. Not all encampment to home efforts are, are necessarily going to have be that high profile, but I think as we're we're seeing that tends to be the case more often than not, just because people are concerned about, you know, what's going on in their community. We're seeing same thing with like PSH construction and, and concerned community members. So the ability for um, folks who are doing that work to have a place to, to be together and a, maybe away from some of the public scrutiny, I think is also a really valuable thing to consider. Fantastic. Well, um, big thank you to Marisa and Nick um, for talking about their research and takeaways and lessons learned um, through each of their projects. Um, Saba or Gary, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Thank you, Nicole. And thank you, Marisa and, and Nick for the work that you're participating in and leading. Um, I was certainly struck by the fact that as uh, we think about places to project our scarce resources, those people who are on the front lines every day, who are talking to people experiencing homelessness, it came up repeatedly, are, is critical. It came up repeatedly um, um, in, in the previous session as well. I, I remember uh, from, from those, from, from our panelists there. And in that kind of milieu, it's actually quite difficult because it's 
it, it's very clear we need all of the above. We need more resources to support people on the front lines. We need more opportunities to move people quickly inside if they want to do that. And we need more permanent housing and we need more affordable housing. And so one of the challenges that we face, and this is we don't have enough time to kind of wrestle with that, um, is that voters are going to authorize new resources, potentially. Um, city council members are potentially going to authorize new resources. How do we wrestle with the need, which is across the board? Uh, but that's not a question for the panels, uh, panelists specifically. I, I do want to end with, with one more question for everyone that was with us today. Um, RVs have come up in a couple different ways, and it's not something that we've talked a lot about in HPRI or in our previous uh, symposium. And I wonder how to how we can kind of think about the role of RVs and or cars um, that provide some support for people experiencing homelessness. Certainly, it's a better place to be for them than living on the streets themselves. How can we take advantage of the fact that people are actually in these, you know, in some cases, an RV that might not be able to move, but a semi-permanent structure to actually provide services? And if so, how do we go about it? Because I can imagine there'd be lots of situations where if someone was offered, quote unquote, an, a motel room, that they'd actually prefer to stay in their RV. So what are the things that we're learning in terms of, and maybe inviting the first panel back if you're still with us, in terms of the front lines, like how do we actually engage with people living in cars and RVs in a way that actually improves their situation, but also um, identifies needs that we perhaps have been, not been identified to date? Does anyone have any insights on that? Yeah, I, I have something to say about that. Um, Thanks, uh, first, um, hi, everybody. Um, so. Um, keeping people or giving them a safe park to bring their vehicles to um, also gives the opportunity for case management to be in that same location. So it's a much, much more efficient method of delivery than having to go to each individual encampment mm -hmm. to deliver or RV to deliver these services. Um, and, and I'm speaking on that, but there's not a lot of safe parks available. In fact, I know in Spa 3, there isn't one at all. So um, it's something that would have to be developed over time. Thank you. Yeah, Kim. So um, our program primarily deals with RV uh, trailer and camper dwellers. Um, specifically, our intervention is geared toward those uh, encampment residents. And yes, they would very much like a motel room over their RVs for, for the vast majority of the people we work with. Um, the, the vast majority of the people we work with live in vehicles that are in very poor condition. Mm -hmm. And I know there's this, I hear this a lot. I hear there's a couple of myths I hear around um, RV homelessness, that people living in uh, campers, trailers, and RVs do not consider them some ho themselves homeless. That has not been my experience. Um, they very much recognize that they are unhoused. Um, the other idea is that um, <clears throat> that they would that they would definitely not take housing or that, that they would not give up these vehicles. And that has not been our experience um, at all, that mm -hmm. they would very much rather be inside and um, and get rid of that vehicle. What we do, though, is we help them to transition from their vehicle into housing and whether that's through storing their vehicle while they're making the transition. Um, but yes, I, I, I want to, and I realize that there's also this idea that everyone's renting um, RVs. That also has not been our experience. Um, I think we've actually met one person who uh, who was a renter of a vehicle. Mm -hmm. But yes, they are they are very very much interested in these interventions, and they are. And um, to Scott's point, if we had RV safe parking, that would be another landing spot because right now, you know, we bottleneck in housing. Um, but there's a lot of misconceptions about our vehicle dwellers and, and they very much would like, <laughs> they would very much like single household occupancy spaces. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kim. And this is, you know, points to this intersection between research and, and practice, because 
you know, if you have myths, myths can be busted if you actually bring the data to bear. And so it's a pleasure for us just with, with HPRI to work with you so that we can help do some of that. Um, so well, let me turn it over to you if you have any one last question or just a final comment uh, for our audience today. Uh, it's been such a tremendous opportunity to have this conversation with each of you. And thank you so much for all of the questions in the chat. We've been um, you know, and the comments, the conversation in the chat, I think we kind of, you know, ran into time crunch here, but uh, I do have one uh, question that I'd like to pose um, to the folks that maybe uh, the, our research panelists um, around practice, which is something that, that Gary mm -hmm. just mentioned. Um, so, you know, in terms of the research that, that you've done, how, how do you see it translating into practice? Um, and if we know the answer to homelessness is housing, what's the benefit of further study? I know it's a big well, question to end with, but just what whatever well, you know, is fair. So what I can say is that I think, you know, in various research efforts, and I can highlight both Nick and Marisa and in my efforts currently, is that I think we we like to Deep, do a deep dive into these interventions that we're looking at to look at where we see some of these successes. And Marisa highlighted one that we have found in our research, at least anecdotally right now until we um, uh, get the HFIS data. But we are seeing that consistent outreach by the same outreach team or the same outreach people over X number of days or months is leading to trust in that service provider, is leading to engagement with the service system, and is leading to kind of X, Y, Z to move them into either interim or permanent housing. And I think, you know, outreach is such a big term. It is such a big umbrella to get underneath. And there are so many different outreach methods and types going across LA County and nationally. And I think if we as researchers can do these deep dives to really understand the nuances of these terms and that what's actually happening in the field, that's where hopefully we can add some value um, in thinking about like, oh, is like, this is what we're seeing here. Does this you know, equate to what you're doing over in this location? Like, how are you doing it differently? Um, so I guess that that is kind of how I see research continuing to inform different policy decisions, housing interventions, practices um, in the field. Well, with that, um, I just, you know, again, many thanks for this community conversation. I wanted to also share that this recording will be available on our website. Um, we will have Spanish language translation available. Um, so we just welcome you to engage with this knowledge and to share it out broadly. I know we had some questions about, can we stay in touch with, with our panelists? Please feel free to reach out to me. Um, if you uh, you know want to follow up on any of the things that we discussed and make uh, some organizational connections, um, I'll put my email in the chat. And I just wish wish you all well. Sending lots of love to everyone here, um, and may everyone be be well. And and thank you again for being in community with us.